Mr. would let you know, all right, ahead of time, so that you're not hurrying up and flipping pages in case it's one of those books like Obadiah or something. You'll never find if you don't know where it's at. <laughs> okay, so you're in the book of Hebrews first, chapter 5, and um, um, Psalm 19. Angelise, is that you back there? Hallelujah. <laughs> F folks, uh, there's Angelise. God bless her. Right. Uh, all righty. Taylor and Angelise. For those of us that know them well, amen. Angelise has been up in Reading for several months, was it? Or was it two months on bed rest to give birth to little Trace that we're still praying for because Trace is still, he was born a little early, but thank God. Angelis, is he coming along well? Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. That's awesome. All righty. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. And then we'll turn here in a bit to Psalms 19. The apostle, or the writer of the book of Hebrews, has been talking about the ministry of Jesus Christ, uh, especially in, in regards to his function as a spiritual high priest, which is a reference to the Old Testament system, you know, the high priest. There were many priests, but there was only one high priest, and he was the one who once a year on that holiday that we now call Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. He was the only one who could fulfill the role of taking the blood back into the Holy of Holies, uh, which signified forgiveness of sin for a period of time. Anyway, that is what it's talking about when it comes to verse 11 and this acknowledgement, where the writer writes, we have much to say about this. We have much to say about this. But it is hard to make it clear to you. And then he says in this translation, because you are no longer, because you no longer try to understand. So you guys, it's like a pause. It's like a, a hesitation. It's an acknowledgement. You know, sometimes when I'm teaching and preaching, I mean, not rare, rarely does this happen, but every so often I notice someone's not really paying attention anymore. <laughs> and I, I want to walk up to you <laughs> and just say, hey. <laughs> like, stay with me. <laughs> You know, I promise when, I, when I'm finished, I'll be done. Stay with me. <laughs> that's what that's saying. We have much more to say about this, about the function of Jesus Christ in that high priestly office. Man, it's making, you know, it's kind of hard to make it clear to you because... The King James Version, I always remember this because this is how I first heard it. Uh, because of dullness of hearing. Because of dullness of hearing. That your hearing is not sharp. So... There's so much more to say, but it's hard to communicate it because your hearing isn't sharp. I guarantee you at the marriage seminar at some point as they discuss the marriage rocks will be a discussion about communication, right? You can go there anticipating that. 
And the idea, and this is what I want to talk to us about this morning, you guys, of the communication barrier. Right? Because that's what it'll ultimately, you know, they might not call it that. I remember a time when that was very popular uh, terminology. It's still used today. But, you know, hey, there, we've got a barrier to our communication. And that is what the writer in Hebrews is acknowledging. There's a lot more to say, but I'm starting to sense that it's not getting across to you clearly. And the truth of the matter is, it isn't my explanation. It's your, it's your dullness of hearing. Uh, folks, in the book of Revelation, you don't have to turn there, okay? You should be in Psalm 19. Uh, but in the book of Revelation, in chapter 2 and 3, um, there is a phrase that will keep being repeated, and it, it appears in verse 7, verse 11, verse 17, verse 29. It appears in, it's in the same wording in, in chapter 3, verse 6, verse 13, verse 22. And it is the phrasing, he that, uh, uh, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Right? How many are familiar with that? That there's seven churches and that you know, there's different things said to each one, very distinct. But the one thing they all have in common is that uh, they need to hear what's being said. Distinctively to them. You, guys, you need to realize that every time you're approaching God... That he's interested in speaking. And we ought to hear it. You guys, I say it, you know, almost every week that he's interested in meeting with you. I know that we're here collectively and it's easy to get lost in the crowd matter of fact that's why some people really like the real 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 big churches see because I when I look out over our congregation I can take attendance our size is such and the fact that you tend to sit in the same place <laughs> that I look and I kind of know real fast who's who and notice who's missing You guys, you need to picture that when you come and God looks, that he just sees Lena sitting there. <laughs> and though he sees us all, he sees Lena sitting there. And, and he sees Vernon sitting there in the middle, kind of where Vernon sits. And, and Benita and, and Don in the back and that you could picture yourself being here by yourself in some way that God sees us, even though, thank God for everyone, right? So folks, God is speaking. Let us hear. Let us hear. Let us be mindful that there is potentially a communication barrier, that it isn't that you have received at all, there's actually a lot more for you to have. But it's almost like, what's the point if you're not really hearing? It'd be better to almost stop there and say, let's work on this dullness of hearing before we proceed. Right? Right? Telling you guys, they're going to deal with this at the um, at the marriage seminar. You know, they're going to give us the the, the tips. You know, uh, uh, look in their eyes, <laughs> focus, <laughs> minimize the distractions. Aren't they going to say some of that stuff and remind us that you know? Um, you guys, I, I want from Psalm 19. Uh, I'm actually, how many, how many of you remember in the grammar, in English class, that you used to do uh, diagramming? 
of like sentences? <laughs> How many just loved that? Diagramming? Raise your hand and be proud. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I actually, because I understood it. So I was proud to find the subject and the verb, you know, and the conjunctions and the <laughs> adjectives and the. We're going to diagram Psalm 119. If, if you, maybe you can do it on a piece of paper and if you care to uh, transpose it to your Bibles. But it, it, it lays out some principles, some fundamental principles, this idea that God is speaking and that we ought to be hearing or listening. Uh, principle number one, uh, uh, first six verses, verse one through six, is the idea of God's natural revelation. In other words, Someone might say, well, God's speaking, I, 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 I don't recognize. You know, I don't recognize his voice, if you will. And folks who are not part of the sheepfold would have a tough time hearing the voice of the shepherd. Jesus implied that. He said, my sheep know my voice. That means that those who aren't his sheep have a tough time hearing his voice. And they might say, when, when is God speaking? How is God speaking? Okay, Psalm 19 addresses this at some level with the first six verses describing one of the ways in which God is speaking. And that is through, oh, I'm going to term it natural revelation. The heavens declare the glory of God, the um, Skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens, makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. In other words, this natural revelation is available to everyone. Folks, just like everyone is familiar with the sun. We're familiar with the sun, with the light that it gives and the warmth that it provides. Um, even so, all of creation is somehow speaking. Granted, no, it isn't, you know, a natural voice like you hear, per se, with your ears. All right, we get a little bit nervous about that. Okay, and... Um, but it, it tells us that day after day, the creation is declaring the glory of God. It's pouring forth speech. Um, uh, there's lessons from life about God. Amen. You know, for the, most of mankind's history, up until, you know, the Enlightenment period a little bit, when, when we learned about when we went through church history. Uh, but, uh, you know, all cultures and every nation, they, they, they sense God. In the natural creation. There's a voice that's talking. God is declaring things about himself. If nothing else, his majesty. His grandeur. His great significance. And all cultures and places and, and throughout history have acknowledged that for the most part. It has led to things like nature worship and, you know, some of those, you know, whatnot. But at least there's an acknowledgement that there seems to be more than what's there. Right? There seems to be something great or something behind. Because this creation, nature, is speaking to me. It's saying, find your place in the circle of life, maybe. <laughs> It's saying, I am awesome, bow down to me. 
Right. So much so, and this is just a side reference, but if you read Romans chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, it'll help explain how God ultimately will be right in judging all of mankind because ultimately all of mankind has at least heard from him through nature. Right? So that, well, how can God judge people who've never heard, you know, God, you know, Jesus, the name of Jesus or the, uh, the Bible, they have heard through God's natural revelation. And how did they respond to that? You know, uh, be kind to one another. Cooperate with one another. You know, these are things that almost nature speaks to us about. Take care of what you have. That you have nothing left. Nature declares these things. But then it goes into the next section, supernatural revelation. Verse 7 through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They're sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. For by them your servant is warned, and keeping them there is great reward. You guys, that's in reference to God's supernatural revelation. That is in reference to... Um, the prophets and, and, and the people that God uh, used in what we would call the Old Testament to uh, bring forth what else he wants us to know besides what nature is speaking to us. Amen? Uh, folks, we believe that God has spoken here. Uh, we believe he has spoken through nature, but we believe that he has spoken if you will, supernaturally, above and beyond just nature. And, uh, of, and God's Word, uh, in, in that sense, His written revelation, in, in literally in print, we call it the Bible. We believe the Bible to be God speaking to us. Yes. And um, we also believe that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, right? So the word written is, we call it the Bible, God's speech, and Jesus Christ, the word in flesh, is God's supernatural revelation to us. Do it like this. Be like this. You know, Jesus, the express image of the invisible God. The, right? That's what the Bible calls Jesus. So, folks, it's interesting, but in a sense, I, I always think to myself, when I, when I hold this, I'm, I'm holding the Word in written form. And when I hold on to Jesus, I'm holding on to the Word in flesh and somehow now in me. But both of them end up being Word of God. God's Revelation, God's speaking. And I ought to hear. If I can acknowledge that this is his speech, and uh, uh, the Bible and the life of Jesus Christ are our two surest sources of God's word. They are the two surest. There are others, Reve Revelation. Holy Spirit inklings and nudges and whatnot that we perceive is God saying something to me. Like, Ben, use your popularity to spread the word about me. Yeah. But the two surest would be the written word and the word that showed up in flesh.
uh, psalm, continuing psalm, it says in verse 12 and 13, it, it acknowledges a problem. And here comes a communication barrier. <laughs> okay? And the problem, verse 12 and 13, but who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. You guys, in those two verses, if you'll note the, 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 point, the point that was, uh, you know, God's natural revelation, God speaking. God through supernatural revelation, his word. And all uh, the different ways that it's described, but in all the different benefits that can come from that revelation of the words. Um, uh, the, the problem is me. You know, if you read 12 and 13, you'll see that that one centers on, uh, um, on David, who's the writer of the psalm. And what he sees is problematic. He's got errors. He's got hidden faults. He's got willful sin. Um, uh, amen. He's got the issue of great transgressions. Because there's all this good that God has and that God has revealed. But it's not coming to fruition and the, and the hindrance is himself. Are you willing to acknowledge that? Amen. Folks, God help us, we best be. Willing to say, God, forgive me. I'm, I am the communication barrier. Yes. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and tell him I'm the problem. <laughs> go ahead, turn to somebody around you. <laughs> Tap Joyce. There you go. I'm the problem. Folks, let me explain to you, uh, and it's interesting because in the commitment series, we'll talk about it today, uh, but uh, in our commitment series, we tell people that, that they need to hear from God. Folks, if God is speaking, and it is so clear that God is speaking, then we need to work on our hearing. And we talk about three mindsets that are going to hinder your hearing. All right, you ready? It's, you, most, anyone who's got the commitment series already has this material. Number one is a closed mind. A mind that is um, closed off because of issues like fear or pride, past bitterness, hurts. Uh, things that cause us to kind of erect ba barriers or walls that keep us protected, but then also keep us from not being able to receive the way God would like to. That's a closed mind. And the mind, you guys, oftentimes simply refer to as our heart. Okay, because when we talk about our heart as a part of our personhood, we're not talking about this muscle that just pumps blood. No, we're talking mostly about our mind. And a closed mind is going to hinder you from hearing God. And there, I know there's a fear because we step outside some of these and we get hurt. And then we really want to shut down. Uh, I heard it said one time that, that, that your, your mind is like a parachute. It only works if it's open. Right, folks? Come on now. If you've fallen out of an airplane, you, 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 there's great, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's hope because you have a parachute on. <laughs> but you better open it up. <laughs> you can go splat. <laughs> Amen. The hope is that you land on your back and that thing cushions you. No. It's that it would be opened and engaged and save you. Folks, so it is with our hearts. We must open up. 
But we're not going to be able to receive what God has for us. So a closed mind is a big hindrance. Uh, uh, secondly, it's a superficial mind. A superficial mind. Are you genuinely interested? And the key, uh, key emphasis is on genuinely. Folks, for all my life, I've observed. And let me tell you, it's not about church attendance because I see many people attend a lot. But they are on some superficial level where they're somewhat interested for whatever reason. But it's not a genuine interest. It's not a deep interest interest and, and there is you know uh, uh, am I serious about hearing from God about our heart or our mindset that that God acknowledges part of the reason that Jesus taught in parables he explained it a couple times was for those who didn't really want to hear they had a ready excuse they could say, stuff. Oh, what's the guy talking about farming for? You know, why is he talking about, you know, a, 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 a wedding banquet? What's he know about wedding? I, I'm a caterer. <laughs> you know, why is he talking about fishers of men? I'm a fisherman. He ought to talk about carpentry maybe. But in a sense, he gave them an easy, easy way. You don't really want to. And if you ever notice how many times Jesus shared with the multitude and waited to see who would stick around, and to them he gave the explanation. I, I hate to say it, you guys, I, I see in that a pattern of, of saying, are you really interested in me? Will you stick around? Will you hang in there? A preoccup the last one is a preoccupied mind. God bless us. Where uh, this will uh, shut down your, uh, be a hindrance to, to listen because your mind's already too busy. It's already filled with too many other things. Just nod your head if you got that. <laughs> Amen. How many times we sit and, but, and we're present in body, but oh no, we're not really here. Oh no, no, no. We're out there already doing our next stuff and our. And folks, in that sense, Jesus made it clear, look, if you don't, if you, you're going to have to hate your father and mother. That's what he said. You're going to have to hate, uh, uh, you know, and he names things that compete with him in our lives. He was never saying that there wasn't room for those things, but there comes a time when your primary, first and foremost, if Jesus Christ is central to your life, you say it's about him first. Amen. Or else there will be communications from God that will never penetrate the way that God intends it to. And folks, all of us in the flesh, and you're in the flesh, I'm looking at you. We are the problem, oftentimes, to the communication barrier. That's not flattering. But there is uh, something positive about that. And that is the last verse, which is the solution. The solution. Because someone once told me, Ben, if you're not part of the problem, then you're not part of the solution. <laughs> so you guys, your difficulties in your life, acknowledge first and foremost at the starting point that you're part of the problem. Now you can really be a part of the solution. Amen. If you're going to maintain that you're not, then really you've got not too much to add to the solution. But David acknowledged that because he realized there's the nature is speaking about God. God's supernatural, supernatural his word is um, uh, speaking. But there is a hindrance to the communication. The hindrance is, his, is him, and that's what the dullness of hearing so he said, may these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Oh, Lord, my, my strength, my redeemer, my rock, my redeemer. 
You guys, the solution is in, in, in humbling yourself. And it is humbling. That's why some people will never come to Christ in repentance because they can't bring them to, themselves to say, I am the problem. God, have mercy on me. Mess this up, mess that up. Folks, if you're going to come to a Savior, you're going to have to acknowledge that you need saved. <laughs> or else he can't be your Savior. With a sincerity, with desire, with a prayer, with a reaching out to him, with an understanding that his, you know, he's life. He's life. With the attitude that says, help me listen and obey and change, Lord. Help me to listen, obey, and change, Lord. That's the pattern from the onset of God speaking. You know, I, I referenced all these places in Revelation. Listen, in Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse 3, 6, 9, 11, 14, 20, 24, 26, 29. There's a phrase in Genesis chapter 1. Nine times. What's the phrase? That's a good guess, but not. And God said. And God said. And God said. Folks, from the onset, God has been speaking. Creation responded right away in obedience. That's the creation story. He said, let there be light. And creation said, yes, sir. <laughs> and uh, uh, let, 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 let the, uh, uh, the seas gather and let dry land appear. Yes, sir. And on and on and on, right? Isn't that the creation story? That God said and creation responded in obedience. And, um, and as a result, there was dramatic change. Right? Isn't there dramatic change in Genesis chapter 1? Because God spoke, because nature responded in obedience, and the result will always be dramatic change. That's the pattern. That's why it's so important for you and I to deal with the communication barrier. Because it will short-circuit It will interrupt the completed uh, uh, a circle of, of God's communication. And God's communication isn't complete until we hear it and respond in obedience that he might bring about dramatic change. Oh, somebody give me another amen. <laughs> Folks, this is so true. Hallelujah. God, help me. And as long as he's helping me, God help you. <laughs> All right? You guys, I'm preaching to me hard here. But it's, it'll be the same for you. It's been the pattern since the onset. It's the pattern all the way in the book of Revelation to the churches. Will you please hear me? Hear me to the point of obeying me. Watch me do dramatic change in your life. Isn't that the hope that we have in Christ Jesus, you guys? It is the hope that I have. Amen. I, I got no problem saying I'm a, I'm a problem. <laughs> I'm, I'm a hindrance to myself. And I'm not proud of it. But I want to work on it. Amen. How many with me? Are you with me? Hallelujah. I like the way your arm shot up, Rhonda. <laughs> I think you were listening. <laughs> Hallelujah. You guys let me pray.